Good day. Welcome to AJC Europe Connects, powered by the American Jewish Committee. AJC Europe Connects is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, con content, and advocacy from wherever you are. We are delighted to be joined today by Mr. Marian Turski, a historian, journalist, chair of the Polian Museum Council in Warsaw, a survivor of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and a fighter for human and civil rights. Moderating today's conversation is Dr. Sebastian Rayak, acting director of AJC Central Europe. After we hear from Mr. Marian Turski, we will take your questions. You may email your question to ajccentraleurope at ajc.org or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Sebastian, you have the floor. Thank you, Barnabas. It's a great honor for all of us to have Mr. Marian Turski a warm welcome on behalf of AJC and our viewers. Mr. Turski, I know we have also uh, AJC leadership with us, AJC President Harriet Schleifer, AJC CEO David Harris, and Chair of the AJC Central Europe Board, Mr. Steven Zelkowitz. We are delighted to have so many attendees who want to join us in commemorating the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising as we mark its 78th anniversary. Once again, a warm welcome to everyone. Uh, let me start uh, with a question that I think very few people have asked, and it's a question about hope. Uh, ghetto fighters often said they didn't rise up to defeat the Germans, but only to choose the way they were going to die. Mr. Torsky, you certainly talked with combatants of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, did they really have no hope of survival? And you yourself as a survivor of the Litzmannstadt ghetto of Auschwitz-Birkenau and death marches, would you say there was never any hope? Or maybe the contrary is true. Maybe those who lost all hope were the least likely to survive. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. A very hard question, because I would say, well, my, my friend, Heine Birnbaum, a Polish Israeli poet who lives in Israel, she wrote her memories entitled, The Hope That Is Dying The Last. And this is true, so long you live, you have some hope. And this is also true, because if not, I wouldn't be alive. So, but the question, what was the approach, the attitude of those young, dedicated, courageous, idealists, young people in the Warsaw Ghetto, yes, they knew that rather the great majority of them would be killed, would die. So in a way, the way of thinking also among them following my research, my conversations to those so long as they were alive, because it was 40 or 50 years ago when I started making a research a study on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So I tried to meet all those who were still alive. Their approach in the beginning was probably for sure, it would be a kind of Masada. Masada, which was the last resistance to the Romans when they mm, crashed the Jewish uprising in the year 70, 71, 72, uh, when they destroyed totally uh, Jerusalem. 
and the last place of resistance was near the Dead Sea, Masada. Finally, when they understood there was no more, no more hope, all but four people, rather women and three children, all committed suicide because they didn't want to become slaves, to be enslaved. Therefore, Masada was for 2,000 years a symbol of resistance. And I would say, according, following my talks, my conversations to those survivors, that in the beginning, they rather presumed, presumed that it would be the last battle, and if not, they would follow the pattern of Masada. It has changed afterwards, but it's another story, because when they understood that their resistance is more successful than expected, you can read the wonderful letter of Mordechai Anielewicz to his deputy, uh, Israel Zuckerman Ante, how he was proud of the Jewish resistance. And then they start to think maybe if there would be a chance to survive the uprising, maybe we, we would, we are obliged to continue the resistance in the clandestine movement outside the walls together with the Polish uh, underground movement. So they started in time of the uprising, looking shelters, sanctuaries, and ways how to get out by, uh, by the canals, by, by, by so the different ways to get out when in case there would be no other chance. So the way of thinking has been changing. The letter that you, you have just mentioned, I, I think you, you, you had in mind the letter sent on April 23rd. It's a very inspiring letter in which he, in, it, in which Anjelevich mentions the fact that he's so proud to see uh, Jews take up arms. And this brings me to, to my second question, because there, there tends to be a sort of a tension between resistance, military resistance, and something people call passivity, which is, I, I really don't like the word, I would rather say impotence or weakness. We, we glorify uprisings and, and the fighters, which is both right and understandable, but do we not, by the same token, show some kind of disrespect to those who did not revolt against the oppressor gun in hand? Most didn't revolt, and that also holds true with regard to the Poles, the French, the Dutch. I think, I think this dichotomy is a bit unfair. Should we honor those who didn't take up arms in the same way we honor the fighters? Well, a very good question, but I would divide it into two topics. The first topic, I will come to the second, to your conclusion. I will answer afterwards, because it is, I cannot escape from the answer of this question, to this question. But we have to start with another question. With a, with a basic question. I was very often while lecturing in the States, in, in Europe, in Poland. Why was the uprising so late when the entire nation was murdered? And very often people even with good faith, with good intention, without willing to offend the Jews, they asking, why did they wait so long? They knew their fate was 
we know that their fate was absolutely the, the sentence of their life was passed. So they there was no chance for them. Why they didn't stood up at least to kill one German with a knife? They would be so and so killed. Why didn't they try to do something to resist? This is maybe a very important question. And this, excuse me, but it will take me some minutes to answer it. First of all, first of all, I am, I, I have very many prepositions, very many uh, presumptions to answer, but I will take only some of them. Imagine, okay, let's start with another one. How many calories a day need a human being? If he is not hard worker, he needs 2,200. If he's a miner, he needs 5,000, 6,000, 7,000. But not really. A man, a, a, a human being, he needs at least 2,000 2, calories. Imagine we got in the ghetto in the woods, and in Wolf it was even worse, 700 calories per day. To us, it is unimaginable, but if you can have a glimpse into Sudan, into Yemen, into Nigeria, where it was the great hunger, then you can understand what does it mean? You have only bones and skin, bones and skin. And people who are starving, this a total change in their, in their mentality. By the way, I will tell you something which is to be praised in those horrible days. In the Warsaw Ghetto, a team of doctors, medicine doctors, 20 people headed by Dr. Milejkowski, they decided that it, is, it was their duty to do something for, for the mankind. In what, what have I in mind? You know, to find out the microbe, uh, the reason of uh, TBC, uh, of COVID, of Corona, you can, you, you have to look, uh, make a research in a lab. You need a microscope, you need a lab. There is only one disease which you cannot do in a lab. It is a starvation disease. And this is there uh, only some possibilities. And they, like, as I mentioned, in Yemen, in Sudan, in Nigeria, and in the Warsaw Ghetto. And they considered it as their duty in those horrible days to make a study, a research, a scientific research on starvation disease. It took them uh, more than eight months with making pictures, making all kind of uh, research. I'm not going in details. And they wrote even a conclusion of it in three copies, handed over one outside the walls to the Polish underground movement. And this is how it was preserved. So we have one of those. By the way, only one out of those 20 doctors survived the war and only one year. And what is the conclusion? I took the, one of the conclusions. An organism dying from prolonged wasting anger becomes like a candle being extinguished. Life withers away gradually without being visible to the naked eye tremor. And I'm going 
just to show that a starving person slacks his awareness. His movements are sparse as if calculated. The slowness or even immobility lasting sometimes all day, inclination toward the lying position, sleepiness, dormancy. This is a common picture of a decrep de decrepitude which has been marked by hunger. And this is because the man is saving his, by saving his moves, he wants to save some energy. I'll tell you something. I was in Auschwitz, in Birkenau, in Auschwitz. And if we don't speak about the Germans whom we, whom we hated, of course, we hated also some of the inmates whom we hated. The people from the Sonderkommando, maybe some of you have seen the movie which got the Oscar the son of Saul. And this is about Sonderkommando. Those, yes, mainly Jews, not only, but mainly majority Jews who were in Sonderkommando being forced to help the Germans to take the people into the gas chambers, then to clean the chambers, then to sort the, 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 the properties, and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. We hated them. But they were the only who could afford a mutiny, an uprising in Auschwitz. Why? Because they were strong. They were healthy. They were really people who could make the decision. I could make it. They could make it. So this is, you know, how hunger, how starvation makes an impact, influences. So don't speak about people who have no possibility to making decisions. This is first. Secondly, to make why the the, 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 the uprising was possible. I will tell you something you now very, very cruel. Okay, let's start something else. Coming back to your first question. When the great uh, deportation from Warsaw Ghetto started, it started the 22nd of July, 1942, and it lasted till September 42, and they took, in this time, almost 270,000 people to the death camp. Three days later, three or four days, we have different um, minutes from it, there was a convention, a meeting of all leaders of Jewish parties, all Jewish parties. And the young people, including Zuckerman, because Anielewicz was not at the time in, 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 in Warsaw, he was in Sosnovy. So he demanded, let's go out, let's resist, let's people in Warsaw, our Jewish people see the blood on Warsaw streets before they go to Treblinka. And what was the answer of very decent, very responsible, very dedicated Jewish leader of elder generation, like Rabbi Zisha Friedman, like Professor Schripper, great dedicated Zionist, they dedicated the religious leaders. No, we can't do it. If we start doing it, the entire population would be wiped out. And in case we don't 
stay against them. We, 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 we don't struggle. Probably a part of the population would be preserved, would survive. People still believe that there would be maybe a great offer, a great, a great part would be victimized, but still a great part also would, would stay alive, could stay alive. So you see, this is, we know it today because we know what happened. We know it because we know it in hindsight, but we should look at those events, what happened those days, to the, 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 we have, have to watch this process with the eyes of those who lived in those days, who couldn't know what would happen. We know what happened, they didn't know. And still, listen, and still always, as you mentioned, yes, still, Everybody believes that he, maybe he will survive. Maybe he will survive in a way. He, he, he couldn't imagine what way, but still some hope. Therefore, I, you see. I would fast forward if, with your permission, Mr. Torsky, I, was, I would fast forward to the 60s and I'd like our, our viewers, specifically those who have joined us from the US, to, to see that there is a link between your experience as a Holocaust survivor and their experience as Americans. In, in 1965, you were on a scholarship in the US. That was a time when the black community was rising up to fight for their rights. So you were there in Alabama, you were marching from Selma to Montgomery. And as we know, many Jews went down south in solidarity with black Americans, but you were most likely the only Polish Jewish Holocaust survivor there. Did you share your personal story with, with other marchers? How did that, uh, how did they react? Did that resonate with, with them in any way? Thank you for the question. I will answer it, but excuse me, I will take only three, two sentences more to finish my former um, uh, arguments. Uh, so what I wanted to tell, it is something cool what I will tell you, but only after the families, the fathers, the, 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 the children were taken to be murdered, to be gassed in Teblinka, those who were left had no more responsibility for the families. And they could also make the decision about the uprising. This is very important, very important. This is a cruel conclusion, but this is very important. And now to your question, Lars. Well, of course, when I was there, by the way, questions this kind was asked by, I was a bench, next bench in a church in Selma. It was a kind of being interred. Well, we couldn't get out of Selma, but inside of Selma, we could move. It was uh, Ralph Abernathy, the deputy of uh, uh, Reverend King, of uh, Martin Luther King. We liked each other, and he very often asked me, how do you think could what happened in Poland, what happened in Germany, what happened in Auschwitz, could it be, could it happen else, uh, elsewhere? Could it happen in another? And I told them very frankly, yes, it could. Also in your country, it could, because, because if you see this kind of hatred, if you see this kind of people, white people, people in the street who are defending their, being their status-minded position, and what was their status-minded 
only the white skin, nothing more. If it would be, uh, the, if they would be changed by 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 black people, they probably would. Uh, they wouldn't win the challenge. So you see, this is also a way that it could happen also in your country. And I will tell you something. I was so moved when I was listening to ex-governor Arnold Schwarzenegger um, statement after the, uh, the attack on the Capitol. It was uh, January the 6th this year when uh, Schwarzenegger for the first time confessed that his father was an Austrian Nazi, that his father, and, and he understood how it happened because it was a lie on a lie, lie on a lie. And this is also something which makes me brings me to a conclusion, when we speak about Holocaust denial, it is denial of facts, denial of truths, denial of what happened, and putting into minds of people fake news. It lies. So this is what I would say that I was so happy looking what happened in, in Washington January the 6th, because this was the an answer, because when they asked me, so what to do in Selma, I told them, it depends on you. If you would be able to defend your democracy, you will win. If not, you will fail. Okay, I will. Thank you very much. I will. Um, I will now ask my my last question before I turn to to Barnabas for questions from from our audience. So my my last question would be um, that may sound a little bit uh, controversial, but we uh, every year on several occasions we repeat never again, never again. I I'll be frank with you. Sometimes I I feel we we are repeating this slogan, which is supposed to be powerful, but don't you feel that we as humanity have compromised this slogan, this, this appeal? I wonder what you thought, how you felt as you saw the world watch mass murders in Cambodia, in Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Darfur, and more recently, we, we are watching what, what's happening in Syria and in Iraq, crimes against humanity, against the Uyghur people, what does a Holocaust survivor think? How, how does the Holocaust survivor feel witnessing these things decades after the Shoah? My dear friend, there is a Latin proverb that history is a master in our life, that it helps us to understand. Yes and no, I would answer as a historian. Yes and no, because very often people repeat, repeat, errors, mistakes, misunderstanding, which took place in the past. And not very often contemporary people, people who live together with me, are able to jump into conclusion when they judge, when they follow, when they study the past. Uh, 
this is also why I will tell you, I, as a survivor, I don't even want, it is not my greatest desire when I speak about the past, just to look for some empathy. Yes, empathy, yes, but for uh, compassion or for pity to what happened to me. No, I always speak to people, look to your fate, to your future. If you want to avoid something which happened to me, try to crash, to avoid, to prevent, to take away those circumstances, those conditions which built passes, which built Shoah, which the end of it was Auschwitz. And end of it was something like, uh, was the Warsaw uh, ghetto uprising. So this is the only way if you want, if you want to survive. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I really uh, appreciate the, the fact, Mr. Tursky, that you uh, had the time to join us. Thank you for this conversation. And I now turn to uh, my colleague Barnabas, uh, who I assume has some questions from our audience. Thank yes, thank you both for this fascinating conversation. Now we would like to take some questions from our audience. And then I would like to remind everyone that you may email your questions to AJC Central Europe at AJC.org or simply use the Q&A feature in Zoom. The first question is from Philip from Warsaw. Mr. Tursky, I remember last year on Holocaust Remembrance Day, you said Auschwitz did not fall from the sky. Hundreds, thousands of little steps led to the Holocaust. You said this as a warning, but as a warning against what exactly? Is this warning still important today? Uh, it is important today. It would be important more tomorrow. It would be even more important day after tomorrow. Because, of course, Auschwitz, as Auschwitz, might not happen. It means kind of uh, extermination scam, but, but look what happens, and Mr. Reyak mentioned it, what happens to the Uyghurs in China, what happens, uh, what happens, how is low broken, crashed in very many counties, how they don't observe the law, how, uh, and how people are not sure if they would be defended. So this is true for today and for tomorrow from this point of view, because Auschwitz is only a symbol. It is something, destruction of uh, humiliation of, of human being. It is depriving a human being his title, his rights. This is Auschwitz, not only just put into the guard. This is the at most macabre, horrible way. But what happened in Rwanda is for anybody being killed with a marchetta, with a knife or with a or the cyclone B, it is the same life. He loses the same life. Thank you, Mr. Torsky. The next question is from Miriam, Miriam Marcus. What do you feel has driven the rise of extremist political parties in Poland and the recent sentiment for Polish historians to downplay accounts of complicity in the Holocaust? Uh, this is something 
o dvih historijas. I demand all the time that we are researching facts, we are researching sources, we are analyzing sources, because if some conclusions should be taken, so you cannot do it if you don't analyze the past, but of course, you should analyze it fully. You can't take only some part of, I would say, positive facts to my mind, to my opinion, to, to my uh, taste, and uh, separate them from others. History is not only shadows, not only Lights, it is lights and shadows, ups and downs. And a historian, he's, he compulsory, obligatory, his duty is to analyze it all together. So whenever you have any uh, barriers uh, for historians to make a research, it means you do it, you had yourself, you had uh, the society, you, are, you had the nation, you had the community, because it is like a physician. He has to know everything about the body in order to, to, to find some recipe. This is why we are so against restriction making and, and also discouraging young people to, to make a research, a, 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 a honest research, a true research. This is also why it is so important. Thank you. Our next question comes from Lisa Weimer. What would you say to young adults today who are struggling to understand why there were so many bystanders who did nothing to stop the Holocaust? And how would you inspire them to be upstanders against injustice today? My dear friend asking the question, I would say, that general, the majority of, of any society are rather bystanders. But sometimes there are some situation in a community life in a nation's life, in a continent's life, when the bystanders, those who are just away, outside, when, if they want to to prevent something horrible, they have to, to overwhelm their passivity. This is also what, excuse me, that I will quote myself. So this is also what I put in the, in, in the appeal, by the way, I repeat it after my friend Roman came from New York. Don't be indifferent because people should engage themselves. They should understand that nobody, also in democracy, maybe just in democracy, democracy is based on 
an activity of the citizen. So this is why we demand people don't be also a fan, don't be also an outsider, don't be also a bystander. And by the way, there is also, and I we know it from the time of Shoah, that there were bystanders. Not all bystanders were the same. Some bystanders just were afraid, but they were friendly bystanders. The other bystanders were hostile bystanders, those who would denounce, those who would lend a hand to evil. This is also a very important gap between bystander and bystander. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Chaba from Budapest, Hungary. As a survivor of the Holocaust, what message do you have for younger generations? What can you repeat? As a survivor of the Holocaust, what is your message for younger generations? Mm. I try to do it all the time. So let's repeat it. Don't be indifferent. Don't wait that some other people will do it for yourself. Don't accept a superficial understanding of democracy that the majority can do everything. Yes, the majority which runs politics is entitled to run the country, but provided, and this is a condition, it doesn't deprive, it doesn't uh, wipe out the rights of the minority. So this is my, if I could say my message. Thank you so much. And our last question from our audience from Nina Mogilnik. I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. And my question is how people like you and my father emerged from the horrors of the Holocaust without bitterness. Was that who you were before the Shoah or who you became after? I am not sure that I understood the question, but no doubt that the Shoah was such a tremendous landmark in my life. No doubt. Because um, maybe my dear friend who asked me this question, maybe today you could understand it better. Today, when we see that we are, uh, that we have no way how to escape from the corona. When we see, when sometimes you are witness how your friend yesterday young, yesterday strong, yesterday vivid, how after the corona is changing. So in I think today maybe you would understand me better when you have seen normal people, normal working, normal studying, and suddenly being humiliated being kicked out from their position, being, uh, being terrorized, being intimidated. So this is, and some people ask me, what was the worst in time of the Shoah to me? 
I would say two items to first accumulation and second partition being when when you when you know that is the last time when you see your father, the last moment that you see your mother, and when you do when you do not hope more to see them in life. So you see, this is what make was made me maybe different after the Shoah. Thank you so much, Mr. Torsky. And now we have time for one last final question from the AJC Central Europe board member, Janice Ellen. How is it possible that historians who wish to engage in Holocaust revisionism be appointed to an institution whose purpose is to memorialize the history? It is possible, but it is indecent. Of course it is possible, because after all, there were also in Germany so-called research institutes. There were in very many fascist countries, the academies of, of science and so on, so, 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 so. so it is possible. But should we agree? Should we accept it? So this is the question that we shouldn't accept it. We shouldn't be indifferent to it. Thank you very much, Mr. Torsky. Thank you, Barnabas, for reading out the questions. Um, again, I, I, can't, I can't even find words to thank you, Mr. Tursky, for, for being with us, sharing your experience, your thoughts, your feelings. And with this, uh, we uh, are closing this special event. Uh, I want to wish you, Mr. Tursky, uh, the best of health. And I hope uh, for all of us to live to uh, better days when we will be able to meet in person, when life will uh, we we, we uh, often say we'll go back to normal. So please be safe and thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you both for that fascinating conversation. The recording of this conversation will be available on the YouTube account of AJC Central Europe. I would also like to thank our global audience for joining us. If you enjoyed today's program and would like to get in touch with the AJC Central Europe office, please email us at ajccentraleurope at ajc.org. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.